Father, I thank you that this is a day of salvation. I pray that every heart in this place, God, would be open to believe and receive all that you have for them. I pray that there will be people today filled with your Holy Spirit, fresh and anew to overflowing, that the rivers of living water would be opened up. Every blockage in the name of Jesus be removed, that the rivers of living water can flow out of the bellies of your people. Father, I thank you that today that you are releasing revelation over your people, that blind eyes are opening, ears are opening, minds are opening, Father. I thank you. I thank you, God, that we are being transformed into the likeness and image of Jesus by the power of your word and by the experience of your spirit. I thank you, God, for releasing healings and miracles today that sickness had to go. Sickness today was broken off of your people. I thank you, God, that you are uh, the restorer. And today, God, as we talk about the restoration, one another element of the restoration that you have for us, that it would so sink into our spirit, Lord, that we would be transformed and we can never go back to the way we were. And I give you praise, Father, for that. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. <clears throat> well, we're running just a little bit late this morning, and I have uh, communion yet to serve, so I'm going to give you an expedited vi version of my message tomorrow, today, <laughs> and uh, tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and actually, this topic that I'm on, I'm going to be, I'm going to stay on this topic for quite some time because we're going to, in, we're going to start studying about the kingdom of God and what all of that means to us as, as far as being uh, in the kingdom of God. And so uh, we're, we're just going, we're just starting to brush the edges of this, uh, of uh, this topic. And so just. Be prepared over the next few weeks that we're going to hit it from, this is what I do if you're, you're new in this church. I will take a topic and sometimes I'll stay on it a year or two years, literally, until, we just, until I feel a breakthrough in the spirit realm on that particular subject and we own it until you start preaching it back to me. When you start preaching it back to me, I realize now they've got it. Amen. And we can go on. All right. So last week I talked about creation. And the creation narrative is really important for us to understand as, as Christians. Uh, you know, whenever God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy, Holy Spirit was there at the very beginning of creation, a lot of activity happened. You know, the first five days, God's going, let there be, let there be. You know, all this stuff is happening, you know, boom, boom, boom. Creation, lights and rivers and waters and earth and land and sky and all that kind of stuff is happening. And then on the on the sixth day of creation, God kind of changed things up a little bit, right? Instead of, uh, instead of speaking things into existence, all of a sudden God pauses and he does something very unique and very different. At this point, he makes a statement. He says, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And let them rule, right? So the first thing God did before he formed man was he released destiny and identity over them. In other words, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. That's, that, that's, that's he's releasing identity over them, right? And then he's saying, let them rule. He's releasing dominion and power and authority over them. Even before, he's releasing destiny over them before he even forms them. That's what God had in his heart from the very beginning. And then gently and lovingly, God reaches down and he forms mankind from the dirt of the earth and kisses him and breathes into him the breath of life. So God had such a, a wonderful image in his own heart and in his mind that he was going to create a living beings that would resemble him in the earth, that would be his delegated authority in the earth, that when people looked and when they looked at one another, they'd say, I, I see God, amen? I see God. I see God in you that we were to bear the likeness and image of God. That's our destiny, Amen? That's our identity in the earth. But we also know that some, something tragic happened, and that was Satan come, and he tempted Eve, and he said, he tempted her to, to what? Eat. 
eat of the fruit and we're going to come back to that in just a minute he tempted her to eat of a forbidden fruit and he tempted her with this thought God knows that if you eat this you will become like God now what did God say before he even created them I'm going to make mankind living beings in my it's right in my likeness and in my image so Eve Adam and Eve already had what the enemy was tempting them with isn't that amazing and how many of you realize that whenever the enemy comes at you and I even today he's tempting us with things that you and I already have we have already have everything the fullness of God lives in us and the bounty of all of God there nothing is forbidden for us because we have everything amen we are made in the likeness and image of God so when the enemy comes and you know he, 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 he slanders you and talks ugly about you and, and you know we are made in the likeness and image of God amen amen so um, when they ate the fruit they didn't just sin right we discovered that last week they didn't just sin they became sinners right the very core of their being they became sinners big problem right it was a being problem it says in Romans 5 19 for just for just as though the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners so also through the obedience of the one man the many were made righteous remember last week I shared with you about the dandelions right we had Luke here from Brazil and he came in the springtime and and everything started turning green and all the little yellow flowers came up in the yard and he stopped taking pictures of these sending them to his mom going look at these beautiful flowers that are growing in everybody's lawn and I said we don't like dandelions because we call them weeds that's right and and does it do any good to lop the top off of a, of a dandelion no what do you have to do you have to go to the very root of the issue and so the the point is that whenever Adam and Eve our our spiritual parents whenever they they ate and they were disobedient they didn't just sin but they became sinners to the very core and the root of their existence right that sin became their identity and so at that very point they lost the number one they lost the image of God their very identity this is the first case of stolen identity second thing they did is they lost their destiny or they lost their ability to to to, to uh, their uh, their dominion to rule and reign right and then they lost their relationship from God and I think it's really important to point out here that whenever they sinned they became sinners the relationship between them and God severed but it was not God that did it who hid they hid and who went looking that's exactly right and still today we have this concept that God doesn't God can't communicate with people when they've got sin in their lives beloved that does not square with scripture whenever I see Jesus Christ when he's he's out there who whenever the woman thrown before his feet called in adultery right he sought out specifically the woman at the well and he went looking for a tax collector Matthew right Jesus hung out with sinners as a matter of fact the, the the Pharisees got upset with him because he said here he is eating and drinking with all of these scumbags right and Jesus is like you know what they need a physician that's who I am I came to seek and to save the lost so that's it that's a religious lie if you believe that your sins have cut you off from God God has always been the seeking God he has not changed he's always after you and so those beloved ones that you have in your family that you feel like you know man alive they're, they're just you know they're far far away from God God is after them you can be assured that the God is still a seeking God and their sin does not offend them in the fact that he wants them saved he wants them he loves them amen okay 
And so paradise was lost. And then we see God set up the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, out of God's love, he provided for them the law, and then he provided the bulls and the goats to be crucified for them, right? They were, they were slain uh, on a, either on a daily basis or a yearly basis for the sins of the nations. But what, what happened with the blood of the bulls and the goats? That's like mowing the, the dandelions down in your yard, right? It does not deal with the root issue. Every, every time you mow, the next morning you wake up and those little dandelions are back there as a reminder that you haven't removed the root, right? And isn't that the same way in, 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 our, in the, the life of someone that is not renewed and we're going to we're going to talk about more about this in the future i'm trying to just introduce it right now but when jesus came a major change took place it wasn't just uh turn the page from malachi to matthew and you see the big words that says new testament there that wasn't just the change that took place when jesus showed up major change was there right John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So John the Baptist came in the, in the fashion or the form, in the embodiment of the Old Testament prophet, and he's declaring, Bulls and goats, Lamb of God. There's change in the air. Amen? And then he says, I baptize with water, but there's one coming after you. I'm not even worthy to reach down and touch his shoelaces. And so then he says, Jesus, I baptize with water. Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's right. Jesus did not come to replace the Old Testament system. If he only came to die on the cross to shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, all he was saving was the animal's that died in the Old Testament. Let me, get, let me help you get this, understand this. The Old Testament sacrificial system worked for the purpose it was created for. And that was that sins could be covered. Okay? Sins were covered but never went to the root of a new heart Amen? So when Jesus became the one who hung on the cross, and if we isolate that and say it's only for the forgiveness of our sins, we are only saying he replaced the old covenant, the Old Testament, and the only thing he's saving are bulls and goats. Get it? Because this whole thing goes a whole lot deeper than just our salvation. Salvation is wonderful. That's how we become children of God. And I'm not making that small. But there's so much more that happened when Jesus hung on the cross and said, It is finished. Amen? He didn't just lop off the top of us and say, okay, sin covered for today, right? Okay, sin covered for today. Sin covered for today. What happened? He came and gave us a brand new identity. He went to the very core of our existence. And he removed from us that very sin nature. He said, whenever... Well, I've got so much inside of me I want to tell you. <laughs> Let's look at Colossians 1.15. The Son of God is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist... The Trinity was active at that moment, just like the Trinity was active at creation. Amen? There is the Father, the Son, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit comes down. And God right there speaks identity into his Son and says, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He's speaking the identity there for everyone to realize. Amen? And he is the image, the image that was broken in the, in the garden. Jesus becomes the image, the prototype of who we were created to be, but lost that identity in the garden. Amen? And then we see image. The Son of God is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn among creation, among us. And in Christ Jesus, you and I are that new creation. What does it say? Romans 6, 17. I love this verse. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness, what? Reign in life. So what was lost? Our identity? Our dominion to rule and reign? We have that back through Jesus Christ. Amen? After Jesus' baptism, he declared, Mark 1, 15, The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. In other words, some versions say the time has been fulfilled. In other words, this is, a, this is a time of transition. End of one era. Amen? End of one era. The time has come. New time. The kingdom of God is here. It's near. It's here. I am the kingdom of God. You'll find that out. Jesus is saying, I am the embodiment of the kingdom of God. Repent. In other words, change the way you think about things. Because the old system is obsolete. New era. Kingdom of God. Repent. Repent. And believe the good news. This news is so good that if if we really wrapped our head around it, we would say, it's impossible. It is so outlandishly. You know, people talk about hyper-grace. There is no such thing as hyper-grace. It's because our religious mind cannot get our minds around how good God truly is. That's exactly why we call it hyper-grace. Because grace, unless it is so outlandish that we cannot believe it, it's not the grace of God. It's not the true grace of God. Now, we may, it may get misinterpreted and misconstrued, but I'll tell you, the grace of God is so great that we cannot get our heads around it. It's a superior covenant, new covenant, kingdom of God. And today, we're going to jump right into the last part of this. We're going to talk about communion today because we're serving communion. So last week, I made this statement. I said, Jesus didn't just come to fix us. He came to kill us. I got a, one phone call that week. What on earth did you mean? Jesus came to kill us, you know? <laughs> hey, man. Well, you know what? That's, but that's, that is, if I, if I made that statement, if I, if I don't expound on it a little bit, Jesus came to kill our root. Amen? He came to kill the very root of our sin. <laughs> He came to kill the dandelion root, amen, to give us a new heart, a new mind. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't just die for us. He died as us. Beloved, when he hung on the cross, we were in Christ Jesus. That was God's plan.
plan that Jesus would become the new, crea new creation. He would be the new Adam, that we would be in Adam, that in Adam you and I would die. That was God's plan. He killed us on the cross, not just fixed us and put a band-aid on it. He made us brand new. Romans 6, 5 says, for if you, if we, you and I, if we have been what? United with Christ in his death and his likeness, we will also certainly be united with him in his resurrection or in his likeness in his resurrection. He didn't die for us. We died in him. That's so powerful. Jesus came to kill us, and that's good news. He came to kill the root of the sinner so that you and I could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that you and I could boldly say this, this, this scripture, that one of the first scriptures I memorized, Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not exactly like the NIV, I memorized it, but that's the truth. will not you say, let's read this together and say it as a declaration. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes. One quick verse in Romans, for we know that our old self was crucified. Our old self was crucified so that the body ruled by sin might be taken away. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Beloved, we are not slaves to sin. And we are not sinners saved by grace. You have a new identity. That sin root has been broken. You are not a sinner. You were a sinner saved by grace. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Sin will not have dominion over you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Amen? Amen. I'm going to have to skip ahead. That'll come back. We'll, you'll, you'll hear it on another day. That page that I just turned. This morning, I want to take you to the communion table just in one aspect. And that is, God speaks to us through prophetic acts. He, he reveals profound truth to us through physical acts that have profound spiritual realities. Water baptism is an example of that, which we'll have in two weeks. The Bible says that we, are, we die with Christ in the watery grave, and then we come up out of the tomb as new creations in Christ Jesus to experience resurrection life. Amen? Powerful prophetic act. That sometimes we don't realize how deep that is. Same thing with the communion table. Remember Jesus said when he, when he was sitting at the table with his disciples and he took a piece of bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. This is my body. And he's pointing to tomorrow when his body was going to be broken. That's what he's pointing to. It's a prophetic revelation. My body's going to be broken and you're going to be broken in me. 
And then he hands them a piece of bread and he says, eat it. Eat it. Where did you hear that before? In the garden. Satan comes and tempts them. And at that moment, when they put something in their mouth, they swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. They believed the lie and they lost what they already had. They lost their identity. They lost their dominion or their purpose in life, their right to rule and reign, and they lost their relationship with God. And Jesus is about to reverse the whole thing and redeem, redeem the whole story, the whole creation narrative. He's redeeming right there at that last supper table. You ate and died and lost your identity I'm going to give you something to eat today that's going to restore your identity, restore your right to rule and reign in life with me and to have intimate relationship with the Father. As a matter of fact, like John the Baptist said, I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit's going to live inside of you. You're going to be my image bearers on the earth. You're going to bear my image and we do, amen? And I love to look in the eyes of people that believe in Jesus and I can just see the light. Amen. So this morning, as we take, as we receive communion, I'm going to ask you to just really see this prophetic reality that God gave us that every time we receive communion, we can remember afresh and anew that the root of sin died and that we have been restored, redeemed, made new, and we have a brand new identity, a brand new real destiny, and a brand new relationship with a loving Heavenly Father that seeks us out. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? We're going to have communion this morning. And if you... Uh, are new here today and just to know that we practice open communion if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior you are welcome to participate in communion today But if you've come in and you're kind of in that spot where you're not for sure about your heart and your relationship with God let me tell you that God's been knocking on your heart's door he's the one who brought you here today he tugged your covers and got you out of bed. And all this worship, this wonderful presence of God that's here this morning, it's a wooing. This reminder this morning of the message, it's a confirmation that Jesus died not just to forgive you of your sins, but to give you a new identity with Him and a relationship with Him. That is beyond anything you could ever ask or imagine. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's just that simple. The Bible also said as many as receive him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. All we have to do is receive this wonderful gift of salvation that God has provided through us to us through his son. Amen. So if, if you just bow your heads, I want to give you an opportunity to just say that just for in your heart. Father, I thank you for every person here. Just whisper to him, Lord, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe that he went into the tomb. I believe that he rose again from the dead. I believe he went back to the Father and he sent the Holy Spirit to live in me. I believe in Jesus. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit and I receive everything that you have for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me my life back. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you said that and you believe it, you're welcome to take communion with us this morning. Amen. Ryan, go ahead. Jesus. Go ahead and serve.